Hello, everyone. This is Julie Hogue with Vegetarians and Meat Lovers Split Table Recipes. And I have a very exciting, amazing guest. I'm so pumped and so excited. She's amazing. Now, I have to ask how you say her name, Dr. Yami. Yami. It's, it's Yami like mommy. Yami like mommy. Okay, that's mm-hmm. easy to remember. Okay, Dr. Yami is a board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, national board certified health and wellness coach, author, podcast host, and professional speaker, a passionate promoter of healthy lifestyles, especially the power of plant based diets for the prevention of chronic disease. She founded veggiefitkids.com where she provides information on plant-based diets for children. She also hosts the podcast, Veggie Doctor Radio. She obtained a certificate in plant-based nutrition, is a certified food for life instructor, and a Jack Canfield Success Principles certified trainer. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a diplomat of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Yami owns Nourish Wellness. Did I say that right? Dr. Yami, mommy, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Yami owns Nourish Wellness, a pediatric practice in Yamaka, Washington, where she lives with her husband and two active sons. Her book is entitled A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. Learn more at dryami.com. And I'll put all the links down in the podcast notes too, so you will be able to easily access them. And welcome. I'm so excited to talk with you. So excited to be here, Julie. You have such a beautiful, soothing voice. I could just listen to it all day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've started doing some audiobooks, so it's really kind of fun for me. And so the podcast is fun too, and I've been enjoying it. So good. <laughs> you you know about podcasting too, because you're a podcaster yourself. Absolutely. Now, is your podcast geared towards everyone, right? And the Veggie Fit Kids is geared towards kids. So you have like both areas covered there. Yeah. And I would say probably the majority of my listeners are moms, you know, they're parents, but there's so many of my episodes that are geared towards adults. I do have specific pediatric episodes. Most episodes Mm -hmm. are going to be fine, whether you have kids or not. Right. Right. Yes. And I know about boys. I have three boys myself, so I (laughs) I know what you're, what you're dealing with. So, and I would really love to talk about being a child vegetarian, because I was a vegetarian as a child. And back then, you know, it was just considered more weird. Like people thought I was strange. And I live, grew up in the Midwest, which is, you know, dairy and meat and farms. And so I was this weirdo. And it's so much more common now. I feel like plant-based diet is so much more common and it's not seen as weird. But what do you th- see as challenges today? I know what the challenges were when I was a kid, but what are the challenges today for kids who, you know, maybe want to be a vegetarian, but maybe their family isn't? Yeah. Well, it's still some parts of the country, I would say it's still more difficult and mm-hmm. it's still seen as very fringy. Mm-hmm. There's definitely parts of the country where it's, like everyday life, you know, being Mm -hmm. vegan, vegetarian, plant-based, all of those terms, gluten-free, every, it's like so natural that nobody bats an eyelash. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to children, the biggest barrier is going to be having to deal with opinions from quote, concerned friends and family members. Oh yes. I have that. So, you know, there's still going to be a lot of opinions. You're still, you know, I do a, have Google alerts for certain keywords. So one of them is like vegan children, plant-based children. So mm. every week you're seeing articles like pro plant-based for kids. And then the articles that come up, you need to be cautious. You need to be careful. Uh. Or, you know, some mom who's getting in trouble because she's raising her kid plant-based. And there's like this whole barrage of opinions mm-hmm. with it. Yep. And of course, when it comes to teenagers, parents get concerned because they were okay. Teenagers suddenly seem to change a lot. And is this really because they're concerned about the environment or animals, or is it because they have an eating disorder and they're trying yes. to disguise their eating disorder as this other thing? And so you know, parents can rightfully so become concerned, especially if they themselves are not familiar with this way of eating and it's, and it can be scary for them. Absolutely. And, you know, I still, to this day, get people who look at me and be like, well, what are you going to eat? And I'm like, 
everything else. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I always think it's so funny. Like nobody looks at someone weird if they don't eat the salad. But if you don't eat the meat, they're like, look at you like you're some kind of alien, like some kind of weirdo, you know. And so that's that's been my experience. So I totally understand the people coming at those who eat don't eat meat thinking they're weird or odd or, you know, strange. Even my own mother was like, what am I going to feed you? You know, <laughs> she was a nurse and I bought her one Christmas. I bought her a, ve- a little vegetarian cookbook because she kept saying, what am I going to feed you? <laughs> and then, like I was thriving, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we live in a day and age where there's examples of every extreme because now we yeah. have the carnivore diet yeah. where there's people literally only eating meat. Right. That's it. And there's people in that movement that are so anti-vegan and claiming that vegan parents are killing their children and they're on a mission <laughs> to like convert all vegans to carnivores. So, <laughs> so it's, Good it's luck with that one. If, if you're on social media, the algorithm finds you and finds and shows you those things and it can yeah. put doubt into a lot of people's heads. Absolutely. So so as a pediatrician, that's like just totally bogus, right? The carnivore the whole, diet? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think that you would be hard pressed to find a legit, <laughs> like a legit healthcare <laughs> provider that thinks it's a good thing. We yeah. have so much evidence that especially eating red meat is going to increase your risk of disease. We have so much evidence, mm, like okay. decades and decades and thousands of studies. We also have so much evidence showing that eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans is actually really beneficial and decreases our risk of cancer and diabetes and heart disease and all of that. So I'm hoping it's one of those things that has like a little blip and then slowly (laughs) kind of fades away. (laughs) But, but yeah, it, you know, it comes up a lot. Oh, it does. And the other thing too, is people think you're not going to get enough protein if you're a vegetarian or vegan. It's like, Mm -hmm. they don't really realize that protein is in multiple places. It's not just meat. We're like programmed in our brains to think, oh, protein meat. You know, there's so many, what are some of your favorite non-meat proteins? Well, I just want to clarify and emphasize that all whole plant foods have protein. They all have protein. They just have them in varying percentages. So there are some foods that have a higher percentage of their calories derived from the protein macronutrient, some that are lower. So traditionally, we know that things like legumes are Mm -hmm. really higher in protein, but there's some that are going to be surprising to some people because they don't think of them as higher protein foods. It's going to be things like broccoli. Now right. there's a caveat in that broccoli calorie for calorie really is a high protein food, but because it's so low in calorie density, it's not going to be the best source to get the majority of your protein. But when you eat broccoli, when you eat brown rice, when you eat apples, you're getting protein from all of those foods. And as a pediatrician, my main point to parents is that as long as your child is eating a variety of different plant foods in adequate calories, they're getting enough protein to meet their needs for growth and development. There's going to be some cases that might be a little special, you know, people that are trying to accomplish very specific things <laughs> that yeah. maybe they're going to need to be a little bit more mindful. And, you know, here I'm talking about bodybuilders or extreme that yes. are just like, you know, exercising a ton and really tearing up their bodies and they need a little bit more. They may need to be a tad bit more mindful, but if you're just a regular old kid living a regular old American life, eating your variety of whole plant <laughs> foods, as long as you're eating enough calories, you're getting plenty of protein. And believe me, I know this because I follow these kids and their growth charts and they grow beautifully. They're not falling off their growth curves they're thriving. They're happy. They're getting all the building blocks that they need to be a happy growing child. I love that. And I just never really realized, I mean, I know that there's protein in broccoli, but I didn't realize there was protein in an apple. Like I didn't even know that. That's so interesting. You know, you think of the normal things. You think of beans or, you know, some little bit in pasta and rice, but you don't really think about an apple having protein. Yeah. So protein is just the way that, uh, you know, it's just molecules basically. Mm -hmm. And all foods have to have proteins pretty much because that is what actually triggers allergy. So if you think of people that are allergic mm. to things, they're actually allergic uh-huh. to the protein of that food. 
So that's why you can't be allergic to things like sugar because sugar is just glucose or, you know, like a combination of, you know, that it doesn't have protein in it and you can't be allergic to oil because oil doesn't have protein. It's just pure fat, but all whole foods, all whole foods have protein. Now, not all whole foods have fiber. Just want to (laughs) point out that anything that comes from an animal does not have fiber, but all Mm. whole plant foods do have fiber. So all whole foods have protein and all whole plant foods have fiber and then also fat. So even when you think of like traditionally low fat plant foods, they're going to have a small amount of fat in there, like a small percentage of fat. And so whenever you hear people say, oh, if you're eating a low fat diet, you're not getting enough fat to absorb your essential vitamins. It's not Mm -hmm. true because when they've done studies, they show that you only need about two or three grams of fat per meal to absorb your essential vitamins. And that's in your whole plant foods. You don't have to add fat. But of course, you know, most people want to have some extra avocados and all those. It's it's delicious. You know, it's yummy. So I'm not saying don't eat those things. But what I'm saying is all these macronutrients exist within whole plant foods in varying percentages. That's so interesting to me. But what I want to ask you too is, you know, I hear different things about dairy. Are you someone that believes we should be consuming dairy as (laughs) humans? I don't want to step on any toes on your podcast, okay? <laughs> but since you asked, <laughs> um, I am not a huge fan of dairy. Now, okay. if you've ever listened to my podcast, you know that I'm not a person to say that things have to be all or nothing. I grew up, literally, my mom would call me baby cow. That is how yeah. much milk I would drink. And so I grew up loving dairy. It did not love me back, but I didn't realize that until wow. I gave it up in my 30s that it was causing my constipation and my abdominal pain, all these kinds of things. Mm. As a pediatrician, I will tell you from my experience that I see frequent adverse consequences from dairy consumption, especially from cow's milk. But the other issue I see just in our standard American diet, we eat a lot of cheese and, you know, cheese is so delicious because it's so high in fat and it's concentrated, like the protein gets concentrated in it. Sure. And so a lot of people develop this like addictive pool to cheese, but if believe it or not, you may not know this, it is our biggest source of saturated fat in the standard yeah. American diet. Oh, so it even goes above meat because everybody wow. eats cheese like all day long. <laughs> so, <laughs> Put cheese on it. Yeah. Put some cheese so, on it. <laughs> so for those people that are struggling struggling with their cholesterol or some other issues like even diabetes and things like that, and they have a little bit of a cheese habit, it might be something to look into and think about because like I said, it can become addictive. And especially for people that just like to pull cheese straight out of the fridge and eat it, that habit, it can add up throughout the day and it can lead to some health consequences. And one thing that happened in my family, which I thought was very unusual, is my father-in-law later in life developed a dairy allergy. And it didn't mm. happen younger. It happened like later in his life. So he's, you know, he ended up purchasing the the non-dairy cheeses and non-dairy sour creams and stuff. Is that a common thing for people to like just all of a sudden develop this allergy out of nowhere? Not really, but I will say that not everything that people call an allergy is an allergy. Mm, Like whenever we, as physicians talk about allergy, we're talking about IgE mediated allergy where you're developing hives and potentially Mm. you could even develop anaphylaxis. But a lot of people do develop sensitivities to things for a variety of reasons. And dairy is a very high, you know, likelihood food that people will develop some sort of sensitivity or intolerance. Most people will develop lactose intolerance at some point in their lives, just because Mm. it's like a natural part of human biology. We're programmed to drink breast milk. So breast milk Mm -hmm. also has lactose in it, right? Lactose is just a type of milk sugar. And so we're born with with these enzymes to break down the lactose, but then Mm -hmm. they usually start to dissipate between two and three years of age. And then the older you get, the more you lose these enzymes and can develop Mm. lactose intolerance. And then there's milk sensitivities, which can cause variety, you know, sensitivity can cause anything like headaches and joint pains and, you know, those kinds of things, abdominal pain. And then there's like IgE mediated allergies. You think of people that have like peanut allergies where they get the hives and they can't breathe. And 
Yes, that's mostly going to happen or discovered in children, but it's not impossible for it to happen in adults. It's just a lot less likely. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, he may not have actually had an allergy. It may have been an insensitivity or something. He just couldn't tolerate yeah. dairy anymore. That's so interesting. Now, eggs. Eggs are dairy, but they're kind of outside of that, what we just talked about. They're not, they're not, they're different than cheese and milk, right? Or cow's milk. Yeah. Eggs are not dairy. So eggs are their own category and it is an animal product. And, you know, I would say that people that they're, say they're vegetarian and Mm -hmm. they're thinking they would like to go vegan and they want to take it step by step, I would tackle the dairy first. Mm -hmm. And the eggs, the part that causes the most problem is going to be the yolk because the yolk is what mm. is high in cholesterol. It's, it's a high cholesterol food. And so mm-hmm. if anybody is struggling with their cholesterol or, you know, has issues with that, or like I said, diabetes, because we know that there is an association diabetes with how much fat we're eating in our diet. So mm-hmm. studies have shown that the more eggs you eat, the higher risk you have for diabetes. Okay. But for some people, it doesn't really affect their cholesterol numbers and things like that if they keep the amount low. But if it is, then they could at least switch to egg whites for a while as they're transitioning Mm -hmm. off. There's a pretty good product though. I don't know if you've ever tried just egg before. I've heard of it. it. Yeah. It's actually pretty good. I'm just going to make a confession that when I transitioned to a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, the dairy actually wasn't that hard for me. Like within a week, mm. I was like, oh, because there's so many plant-based milks and there's, you know, ice yeah. cream and it was fine. Like I just wanted that creamy fatty taste and you yeah. can find that. Eggs is hard because yeah. it's very difficult to replicate that very specific way that those proteins change when you cook them, you know, like it's yeah, a yeah. very specific texture and flavor. So I missed it for a long, long, long time until just egg came out. And now it's pretty widely available and mm. it scrambles really well. You can make omelets with it. And the main ingredient in it is mung beans. So, oh, it's, okay. you know, it's, it's really yummy actually. And then if you want a little bit more of that sulfuric flavor <laughs> that you get from mm-hmm. egg, that sounds gross, yeah. but it's true. That's I know, what I know. The egg flavor, you know? <laughs> There's right. that black salt that you can put on it to give it a little bit more of that flavor wow. if you want, but. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, but for people that are struggling with some of their health markers, that's one that they may want to consider eliminating or decreasing for a while to see if that helps. Yeah. I've heard of the mung bean. Is there, what other ways do people eat that? Because I don't really feel like I know a lot about that. Like you can't just go buy that. Right. I mean, I think they're harder to find. You could probably mm. find them like in Asian markets and things like that, or you can order it online. Like everything now, but I think it cooks more like a split pea or a lentil and that it's, oh. it's a smaller bean, but okay. people have used it before just egg came out. There were recipes where people were using it to try to replicate that eggy consistency. So I think people have known about it for a while. I've never cooked them from scratch myself though. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting that they mimic eggs in some way. Like that's just a thing you wouldn't expect. You wouldn't expect mm-hmm. a bean to be egg-like, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. So in in your own, in raising your own children, so this is something that people always ask me because I'm a vegetarian and my husband eats meat and all three of my children eat meat. So they all say to me, didn't you want to try to make them be vegetarian? And I always said, I believed it was their choice. I wanted them to make their own decisions. What do, what do you feel about that? What do you do in your own life? And what do you advise parents for that type of thing? Honestly, I don't think there's any right or wrong. I think each family and each set of parents has to decide what's going to be right for them. Mm-hmm. Once I learned about the power of plant-based nutrition and the health benefits, and I myself took that ethical transition in my life, mm-hmm. I couldn't bear to have animal products in my house anymore. So, yeah, yeah. and I was the cook and my kids were six years old and 18 months old. So they weren't mm. going to cook for themselves. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> and and, as, and once I assured myself that it was safe and they could thrive this way, I was mm. fine. My husband was on board. So to me, it felt from a health perspective, like I was doing my children a favor that it was yeah. a good thing for them. And if they would have been teenagers at the time and raised on me and loved me and could have been a whole different story. Yeah. Right. But they were little right. and they didn't care. And actually my youngest is adopted and he mm. never liked me. 
Like yeah. we literally yeah. had to like grind it into his food and hide it in order for him to like it. So for him, he was cool. He, yeah, and yeah. still to this day, it's not something that he even wants or craves or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. So we decided that that was the way that we would raise our children. And it never felt to me like I was obligating them to do it because yeah, believe me, yeah. I'm a very good cook and I make delicious, nutritious <laughs> food that I know is great for them. And right. they will attest to this day, how amazing they eat. So they are not lacking in anything, but I've always told them that if, and when they ever want to try things, it's completely Mm -hmm. up to them. I have always educated them though. So they know the realities from the health perspective, from the ethical perspective, from the environmental perspective, they watch all the documentaries with me. And mm-hmm. because I'm an educator in this area, they have to listen to me over and over. <laughs> yeah, so. They will know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. So, I love- you know, they're both teenagers now and my oldest is going to be 18. Okay. And so my oldest, especially because he is like drives and in high school and hangs out with his buddies and stuff, he will yeah. sometimes flex for dairy. So sometimes okay. he may have cheese pizza or, you know, things like that, but mm-hmm he has made the decision that he does not want to have meat. And so sometimes he'll flex for dairy, although he is sense he's always been sensitive to dairy since he was little. Mm. So well, he, okay. it's like my husband, he'll make the choice, but he'll pay the price. And so it's not yeah. something that he is wanting to do a lot. It's just something that ends up working out socially at the time for him. You know, it's just like the convenient choice socially. But if we right. lived in a vegan world where there were always vegan choices, he would probably choose the vegan choice. Yeah. Right. I think it's getting better. I feel like there's more choices out there, more choices at restaurants and whatnot. But, you know, for me, it's probably less than on the coast, uh, both coasts. I feel like they have more of those kinds of options than I do in middle America, but it's improving, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can always ask somebody to leave something off. Like that's the other thing when I go to a restaurant, people are like, well, what are you going to eat? There's nothing for you. I'm very capable of asking them to leave something off, you know? Yeah. And I think I saw something where you did a podcast about that recently about ordering or something about how to order. I saw yes. that somewhere on one of your websites. Can you talk yeah, about that? I have a podcast episode and I also have a download, I believe, under drnami.com mm-hmm. forward slash free. And once you become a little bit experienced, it's not that hard to eat out. Even as a vegan right. who's not eating mm-hmm. any animal products, one of my favorite things to do is scan the menu to look for all the side items. So I'll mm-hmm. see, okay, they're serving potatoes with this steak. They're serving, you know, sweet potatoes, you know, with this fish. They have broccoli with this other thing. So I know they have all the ingredients back in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so- Also, like I'm not shy and I'm a bold person. So I have no problem (laughs) asking the waiter, hey, do you think you could bring me a baked sweet potato with broccoli and the black beans? And usually they're like, oh, we have to go ask. And then they'll go ask. And they're usually like, oh, that's no problem. But sometimes if I'm feeling particularly adventurous, I'll just say, hey, I'm plant-based. I don't eat any animal products. Can you ask the chef to just make me a vegetable platter or make something for me? When I do that, I am not kidding that my plate comes out looking better than anybody else's at the table. (laughs) Everybody's jealous of what I got, but most restaurants, you can find stuff and you can have enough to be full. It's been very rare that there's been a place that I was just like, so utterly disappointed that they did not have like literally anything to eat for a a plant-based person. Yeah, that's been my experience too. And, you know, I I became a full vegetarian when I was a teenager and my entire life I've done that. It's not that hard. And I've done the same thing. I've been saying, I've said, you know, is there just something that could be made that's meatless, you know, and they just come up with something. It's it's, they're a chef. They work in a kitchen. It's not hard for them to do this. And so you don't have to feel like you're stuck to the menu of what is offered. And I think that's something that people need to think about and they don't think that they can ask, but you totally can. I've had the same experience. So many restaurants have just asked and they can do it. Yeah. And they want to please you. They mm-hmm. they want you to spend your money there. <laughs> so remember, <laughs> you're the patron. You're the one that's paying them. So don't feel bad. And I think also it's a mindset thing. I think a lot of people, they think that everything in life is like that. If it's not on the menu, it's not available, but I have never right. believed that in my life. I'm <laughs> so out of the box thinker. Like I love it you have to ask in order to, to receive. And so mm-hmm. it takes practice though. Cause I understand that not all personality types have that kind of, 
you know, boldness to, especially in front of like a large group of people, or if yeah. they're treading in this for the first time and they're feeling unsure. So in that case, call ahead. Yeah. That's another yeah. trick. Like if you know, you're going to be shy. And when the waiter comes, you, your heart rate goes up and you stumble <laughs> your words, just call ahead and say like, I'm going with a group later today, tomorrow, this week, whatever. I started this new way of eating. Would the chef be able to make something like this for me or something like that? And you would be amazed, especially when you give them notice. They're super happy when you give them notice and they'll come up with something amazing for you. Yeah, that's that's so so true. Great advice. People need to do that. They don't need to be a rule follower. In other words, you can <laughs> bend the rules, rules, people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So in talking about recipes, now, do you have any favorite recipes and do you ever publish them anywhere? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just say this because maybe this is a limiting belief for myself too. I do not consider myself like a recipe creator because that okay. seems like so much work. Yeah. Like I am the kind of person I am so easy to please. And I think of something and I throw it together and I'm just like, wow, this is delicious. And then I think, oh, how did I make that? Okay. I oh, think yeah. it was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, so it's way too lazy to be like those people that have to test the same recipe 50 times. That is not my personality. <laughs> so if you follow me on social media, I will post my food. And sometimes people will ask, how did you make that? And I'll have to say, this isn't a recipe, but this is what I did. Yeah, so yeah. you'll just have to kind of tolerate that kind of thing. And in my book, I do have several very simple, whole, ma mainly whole food recipes that people can mm. access and that are very kid friendly as well. And that is a parent's guide to intuitive eating, how to raise kids who love to eat healthy, right? Yes, correct. Tell me more about your book. I think it's an interesting title. Yes. So I really wanted to write a book that would help parents feed their children. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about what to feed kids, but mm -hmm. I don't think we spend enough time talking about how to feed kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what parents actually struggle with the most. And I'm sure you've had this experience, right? You're, I'm sure at least one of your kids at some point didn't want to eat something you made. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, this is a very <laughs> common thing. And usually it starts at toddlerhood and mm -hmm. parents start to get really stressed. They feel like right. their kid's not eating enough. They're going to get deficient in something. They're going to lose weight or they're not going to gain weight. It's going to, and then everybody's worst nightmare that they don't say it unless you press them for it is that something bad's going to happen to their brains. You know, like that's yeah. every worst nightmare. Okay. They're not going to, oh, yeah. whatever. And bad things are going to happen to their brains. So, because parents are so stressed out about this, when their kids don't eat, what parents do is try to encourage them. To, mm -hmm. So they're either cajoling or bribing or forcing. And ironically, that actually has the opposite effect. And so then the child is more afraid to eat or more anxious to eat or digs their heels in even more. And then you start to have battles and everybody ends up in tears. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I really wanted to help parents learn the principles of intuitive eating, not just for how they feed their children so that they can have less stress at the dinner table, but mm -hmm. also so that we can help children develop more confidence around their eating choices and around their mm -hmm. bodies, because- like when we try to emphasize healthy eating, sometimes it, that can also backfire and lead to a little bit higher risk of eating disorders and things like that. So there is a, a balance. There is a way to address these things for the good, the health and the well-being of everybody, but also to help children learn how to be confident in themselves and what they eat. And we do that by showing them trust from the beginning, but doing it in an authoritative way. And what that means is as parents, we know that we are the ones in charge of what, when, and where. So we're going to be the ones grocery shopping and preparing mm -hmm. the food and offering the food. We're going to be making those adult type decisions. We're not going to let the kid be like, I just want to eat goldfish and fruit snacks every single meal. <laughs> and, you know, for that's not their choice. Our choice is what we're going to feed them. But then we have to realize that it's their job it's their choice if and how much they want to eat. And that shows them that we trust them. And over time, that trust that develops also is trust in themselves, that they have the ability to tune into their bodies when they're hungry, when they're satisfied, and tune into their bodies to get that feedback of how food helps them feel. 
Yeah. I was never one of those parents that said, you have to eat everything on your plate. You know, I just never, it just wasn't something that I believed and I didn't want to do it. And I didn't, I'm like too worried about, I didn't want them to like think they have to eat everything. Obesity, you know, I feel like that that leads to or can lead to obesity later in life. If you think you have to eat everything on your plate, you know, you can't waste anything. Don't waste anything. Like, you know, it's, I think a lot of parents do that. And I think it's a backfires. Yes. Well, even the beginning of it. So, you know, there's definitely parents that say you have to eat everything, but there's literally kids that come to the table and they don't want to eat anything. And that's really stressful. And so then there's the parents that you have to take at least one bite. You have to eat this. You have to eat this. You can't eat this unless you eat that. And then there's all of this like negotiating and bribing and (laughs) then the kids like, how many bites do I have to eat before I can, you know, you know, it becomes like this whole thing. And so does take practice and it takes time to learn this new way of approaching it. But I believe that when we learn this new way, it just, everybody's just like more relaxed and just to have more yeah. fun and you can enjoy the meal instead of, you know, always having hot guys, how much are they eating or not eating? And, yes. you know, it's just stressful for everybody. <laughs> It is. It is. And I will say my kids, when they were younger, they were more fruit eaters. Like they were not really into eating vegetables much. I tried to get them to eat them. I didn't force them to eat it. Now, all three of them are totally eat all, almost most vegetables I make. You know what I mean? I feel like, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't like that they didn't eat vegetables back then, but I, you know, okay, you're going to eat fruit. Okay. So I don't know if that was the best way to do it, but that's what I did. And, And now, now they all, they all eat salad, they all eat vegetables. So I feel like it kind of worked, but I know hopefully that didn't harm them not eating vegetables too much no, when they were younger. <laughs> you did awesome, mama. That's exactly what I tell parents is okay. most kids will eat fruit. Fruit is delicious. Yeah. Guess what? Fruit has antioxidants. Fruit yeah. has fiber. Fruit has all these phytonutrients. So fruit is not bad. I think it's gotten this bad reputation because fruit has a little bit more carbohydrates and sugar in it and some simple yeah. sugars. And then parents worry, is my kid eating too much sugar? Mm-hmm. You know, there can be problems if a child is constantly grazing on fruit all day, maybe it could affect their teeth, but that's not, you know, in my book, I talk about having a, a structure, a flexible structure. I don't want kids to be grazing on anything all day because it can harm yeah, them. Sure, but, sure. but for the most part, kids will eat fruit. And I think fruit is amazing. Now, I do encourage parents to keep offering the vegetables, Mm. but don't stress out if the child isn't eating the vegetables, nothing bad's going to happen to them or their brains. And if you don't (laughs) force, just like you did, just by example, you didn't force, you were still offering, you were still thinking about it. They will eventually come around, you know, they will because nobody forced them and made them develop this negative association with that food. (laughs) You know, you know, you'll hear of these kids that are being forced and they're just like, regularly gagging and throwing up at the table yeah, because yeah. people are forcing them to eat something they don't want to eat. And can you imagine <laughs> that just creates this really bad association with that food, you know? Oh yeah. Like my husband tells a story that when he was a kid, his parents literally forced him to eat pickled beets, right? He, so they've literally forced him to eat it and he ate it and he threw it up right on the table and he never will touch a beet ever again. <laughs> yeah. That was <laughs> it for him and beets, huh? <laughs> He's still be like, I'm not, I'm not eating beets. I'm not eating that. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> you know, those things can stick with you for life. You know, like that's just messed up. <laughs> but what yeah, do you do? For sure. So I think, like I said, it's, it can be difficult. It can be stressful. But what I tell parents is to start practicing it, knowing that they're not going to be perfect at it. And what I tell moms sometimes if they get too stressed because they're at the table and their kids are just like picking around things and not eating things, get up and go to the kitchen and take a deep breath and come back when you're calm, you know, because yeah, even yeah. when we give our children looks like we, you know, the mom look the why aren't mm-hmm. you eating that? Or you need to eat more of that is the same thing <laughs> with the look. We can tell them exactly what we're thinking. <laughs> exactly. So I just thought of a, a question that popped in my head. My oldest is 19. He's in college and he is a total bodybuilder. Like he's always lifting. And so he's pounding the protein and he does the protein powders and the protein bars. And I always wonder, is this good for him? Is this bad for him? You know, he eats meats. He eats, he eats very well. He tries to avoid sugar. He eats f- fruits and vegetables, but he does pound the protein. And I just wonder, is that from a a pediatrician perspective, is that harmful? Well, there's a couple of different ways you could approach this and answer it. I will say I also power lift and so does my 17, almost 18 year old. And we're both fully plant-based. 
Okay. And my almost 18 year old is quite strong and quite <laughs> built. So yeah, uh, yeah. The, the plant proteins also work. But, you know, there is evidence to show that when we overload ourselves with animal protein, mm. it's not necessarily going to be immediately harmful, but because it taxes the system more, it actually can affect our longevity. So mm -hmm. it's going to lower our lifespan and it can potentially increase our risk of disease. There's studies that have associated animal protein with chronic disease as well. Like if you think of okay. books like the China study and things like that, mm -hmm. that was looking at the association between animal protein and disease. So okay. that's why even if people do eat animal protein, I recommend that they keep it to low levels. And then if he could start swapping out some of those animal proteins for plant proteins is probably going to mm. be a lot healthier for him and less risky. You know what I'm saying? And now yeah. we're, at, we're at a place, there is plenty of vegan athletes, yeah. bodybuilders, power lifters. So there's lots of products on the market. And he may even find that if he tries some of the plant-based protein powders, it may even feel a little bit better in his body than mm. some of the whey proteins and things like that, you know? So that's how I answer it because he's young and, you know, he's fit. He's probably not noticing any adverse consequences, yeah, but it sure. is something that over time I would worry about the risk. Yeah, I'll have to try suggesting that to him to like maybe look for some different types of products that he uses for supplements mm -hmm. rather than the whey whey based products because I yeah. feel like he uses a lot of those whey based products. Yeah. So the other thing I want to talk about is being a pregnant vegetarian. I cannot tell you how many people were so worried about me and my children when I was pregnant. You're still a vegetarian. You're not eating. They were just so worried about that. So I would love it if you would address that. I know we've talked about it sort of in other ways, but people get extra worried about when you're pregnant and you're growing a baby. Yeah. Which I find fascinating. Like, I guess we just associate meat with maybe the iron. Maybe it's that they're concerned maybe. about the iron because I mean, it's not like you can't get calories from other places, right. you know, exactly. But but no, just to reassure all the pregnant moms out there who are either vegetarian or vegan, it can be perfectly healthy, but just like any other pregnant mom, you have to be mindful, obviously, make sure that you are eating sufficient quantities and, you know, not going overboard with the excuse of like eating for two, cause you're not really eating for two <laughs> whole people. You're right. just eating like 300 calories more. Okay. So that's like a snack. <laughs> and and then also you do want to make sure that you're taking your multivitamin and mm -hmm. also you want to consider if your multivitamin doesn't have one in it to also supplement your DHA omega-3, because mm -hmm. we know from studies that that also helps the development of your baby's brain and, and all of those kinds of things. So, but I think the most important thing, which is what people are not saying to pregnant women, and they're not just like you said before, nobody's concerned if a pregnant woman is not eating salad or fruits and vegetables, yeah. but really that's what I emphasize to pregnant right. moms. Even if they are eating meat, eat your fruits and veggies. We know that some moms have significant morning sickness. So get through that yeah. first. But once you get past that point, eat as many fruits and veggies as you can, because by 18 weeks of gestation, your baby can taste they can actually taste wow. in the womb and the foods that you're eating get the flavors get transferred into the amniotic fluid. And wow. so you can start helping your baby learn to like vegetables and fruits before they're even born. Wow, and that's, that's a amazing. huge thing. We also know that whenever we eat a diet that's high in saturated fat, you know, that's lots of fried foods. We also know that can have adverse consequences on your future on your baby's future metabolism as well. So mm. we do want to be balanced. Yes, you can have your treats and indulge, but don't make your diet only those things. Try to get lots of fiber in there, get your vegetables, get your beans and your whole grains, get a nice variety of all those nutrients, and then take your, your supplement and your, your DHA as well. And you're going to do great. I mean, there's so many healthy pregnancies for moms mm -hmm. that are vegetarian and vegan. So I'm not worried about that. And my children were all, they were all 
decent sized babies. I mean, I didn't have like these little, you know, four pounders or anything. I mean, you know, they were like seven, eight, nine pounds, you know, yeah. so it wasn't any issue, but people were so worried about me and it just, it was hard. The other thing that I would love to talk about when I was, this was many years ago, obviously now. So this maybe is a, a rumor that's not true, but people worried about pregnant women having soy. Is that still a thing? No. I okay. mean, people do worry about soy, but it's mm-hmm. unfounded. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, you know, and when it comes to the types of soy that we consume regularly, soy milk, tofu, mm-hmm. tempeh, uh, you know, miso, things like that, I'm mm-hmm. not worried at all. Now, if somebody's, you know, downing a bunch of soy protein isolate, this a uh, ultra processed food, mm-hmm. then okay. I would worry about that the same as I would worry about any other ultra processed food. But if you're eating your more whole forms of soy, then I don't worry about that at all. It's not harming the development of your baby. There's all these myths about it, you know, affecting your hormones and and it's just not Mm -hmm. true. In fact, the studies show that eating soy helps balance your hormones. So it actually can be good for women. It can be good for women going through menopause and helping them with their hot flashes. And Mm. it shows that women who consume more soy after a breast cancer diagnosis actually Mm. have less recurrence of breast cancer. So it's not causing breast cancer. Mm. It's definitely not causing boys to have boobs or any of that. (laughs) I heard that. And (laughs) if, if soy did help increase breast size by now, I should have significantly (laughs) less. larger breasts. And that has not happened after 11 years of being vegan. So at least it didn't work for me. (laughs) And you know, if that was true, somebody would be out there making a product say, Hey, you can grow your breasts, right? You know what I mean? Like someone make that product. I mean, people would be (laughs) eating soy left and right to get bigger boobs. I mean, exactly. I remember one time those was, it was a co-nurse. So I was a nurse at the time and we were both working and he, he came up to me one day and he goes, you're having soy. I said, well, yeah. And he goes, you're pregnant. And I said, yeah. And he goes, that's going to make your boy's genitals be small. He actually said that to me. And I was like, what? (laughs) Wow. That's a very, I mean, that's interesting that somebody would say that to you. (laughs) (laughs) I know, you know, like there was so talk about rumors. I mean, obviously, and he was very concerned. He was almost like angry at me, Wow, you know, like, because he was a man and he was like, what are you doing to your, your, your boy, because he I knew yeah. I was having a boy. <laughs> like, no, no, that can't be right. <laughs> he is very concerned about your child's penis size. So <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a bizarre thing. <laughs> but I still remember that to this day. So yeah, I think that's great to put out there that, you know, it's not bad to be a pregnant vegetarian. It's not gonna do anything. In fact, it's probably beneficial. Yep. Just make sure you're getting those fruits and veggies. Don't forget those. (laughs) Now, I feel like I hear sometimes people say that you need to have, what is it, vitamin B12 if you're a vegetarian? Is that the one? Is it in a lot of places? When it comes to people not eating animal products, especially vegans, Mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot harder to get sufficient B12 because B12 comes from microbes and Mm -hmm. the microbes then create this, you know, substance, which is the vitamin, the B12. Now vegetarians can usually get a little bit more than vegans. If you're Mm -hmm. eating cheese and eggs and things like that, you can get it that way. But if you're not eating any of those things, then it really is best to supplement. You Mm. could get it for fortified foods like nutritional yeast that has B12 in it, or Mm. of course, Mm -hmm. fortified plant milks. But Mm. I always tell my families that are plant-based just cover your bases. You know, it's just easy to get it in a multivitamin or, you know, a few times a week in a higher dose, very inexpensive. It's not going to do any harm to take it because if you take too much, you just pee out the excess anyway. So it's not like you can get overloaded on B12, but you know, chronic B12 deficiency can cause issues. And that's why pregnant women also need to be taking their supplements because Mm -hmm women for whatever reason, whether they're long-term vegans or something, if they have a B12 deficiency, their baby can be born with B12 deficiency. So it is Uh important to be mindful about supplementation. You don't want to be cavalier about it and be like, ah, just want to live the quote natural life and not take anything because that could affect you and your baby. So take your prenatal vitamin for sure. 
Yeah. And that makes me think of calcium too. I know calcium is in like broccoli and things like that. But, you know, a lot of people think if you're not having any sort of milk, you're not getting enough calcium. But a lot of the, a lot of the nut milks have calcium anyways, right? I mean, yeah. And a lot of the plant milks are calcium fortified. So they add extra calcium in there. I will mm -hmm. say that this is one of those kind of controversial topics because when they do population studies and they find mm -hmm. that the populations that consume the most milk, so theoretically getting the most calcium actually are having the most bone fractures and hip fractures. So wow. there does not seem to be a protective effect with higher amounts of calcium. And some places, the United States is one of those has these recommendations that are set super high and can be difficult for people to acquire unless they're consuming like two to three times a day, some kind of product that has calcium in it, whether it's milk or fortified plant milk. So it is my opinion that when it comes to calcium, you need to have sufficient amounts, but mm -hmm. we probably do not need to have these huge amounts because they have done studies that showed that if you get a certain, you know, lower level, it's sufficient in order to support your healthy bone development and growth and maintenance. Mm. But whenever you start getting higher amounts, especially if you're getting it through dairy products, you could actually have some adverse consequences from that. So I think it's more of a, about a balance and I wouldn't stress too much about it. However, what I tell parents is that for children that have been weaned from the breast and they are no longer on formula, you know, after one year of age, I do recommend that they offer, you know, around 16 ounces of a fortified plant milk per day at meal mm -hmm. times or at snack times. But Sometimes children don't drink it or don't like it. And so they may drink some someday and not the other day. And I tell parents not to stress out. They're still getting calcium from other parts of the diet. And the number one way to ensure healthy bones is through weight bearing exercise, which all yeah. kids are experts at. Okay. They're yes. running and jumping and climbing <laughs> and that's how they're forming their strong bones. And as long as they're getting sufficient calcium and sufficient calories, then they have no problems. That's good to know. That's really good to know. My kids all consume milk, uh, dairy milk, but also we do some almond milk too. So yeah, I know it's, I feel like they're just becoming more and more prevalent, the different types of milks. And, you know, years ago, that wasn't the case. So it's kind of nice to live now where they have all of those available to everybody and great options. You know, they don't like the taste of one, try another. We have options. Yeah. There's only over 20 commercially available plant milks now. Wow. So many choices. Now, post COVID, we've had some supply chain issues. So yeah, everybody's sure. favorite plant milk is like, like literally, <laughs> I'm a hoarder. I'll buy four gallons at a time just because <laughs> like, dude, and the next time I go to the store, there's not going to be my favorite one, but right. But yeah, exactly. there's some really nice products out there. Like I love not milk. Have you heard of not milk? N O T milk. It's I feel so, like I have, but I've never like seen it in a store. It's so yummy. Oh my gosh. Mm. I was hiding it in the back of the fridge so nobody else would see it. So that I could hoard it for myself. That's the kind of mother I am. I don't even like to share with my own kids. But anyway, my point is there's some really delicious plant milks out there. So if you're, if you're wanting to try them out, then, you know, go to the store and see what's available and try different ones out. It's kind of fun. That sounds awesome. I, I'll have to look for that one. Maybe I have to order it online. Like you said, <laughs> we can get so many more things online these days, right? Yes. So tell me a little bit more about your veggie fit kids. You got like actually activities and stuff for them on there, right? Yeah. So it's mostly information and resources and lots mm -hmm. of links to videos and Oh, recipe yeah. videos and things like that. But it's also a great place for people that are just looking for resources. Cause a lot of families reach out to me, like, how can I find a plant-based doctor near me? So there's mm. links to where you can kind of do search web searches for that, or what's a good resource to take to my current doctor so that they learn more about plant-based nutrition. And of yeah. course, recipes, online blogs and books, and my favorite, you know, kind of resources there. So mm -hmm. I created Veggie Fit Kids because when I first went plant-based and had my children transition to a plant-based diet, there just wasn't much out there. And I found yeah. that the majority of what I read was just uh, fear of 
You know, mm. you can't raise your child plant-based or bad things are going to happen if you raise them plant-based. So I wanted to create something that would support families, but also other healthcare providers that were looking for information. Oh, absolutely. So, so needed. Like, you know, yeah, like I said, when I grew up, it was back then it was, it was, there was, there was no resources and people yeah. were worried, you know, so we're living in a better time now where we know more of that information. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to touch on or mention? I feel like I've been asking you a bazillion questions. <laughs> oh, it's been, a, to it's been such a fabulous conversation. Well, one thing I always want to emphasize because, you know, I come on these podcasts and I'm telling parents how to change like everything that they're doing, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I just always want to leave on a positive note and reassure parents that one, you're an amazing parent and your child absolutely loves you. And two, you're doing a fantastic job. So I don't want you to take any of this information and feel guilty or ashamed. I want you to take it more and see how you can integrate some of these tips to make your life easier and to support your child along their life with healthy lifelong habits. So no guilt and shame, just kind of take it, test it out. And remember, it's not all or nothing. You have to find the way that works for you and your family. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you're having as much joy and well-being as you can and passing that down to your children. So I just want to know, want you to know that you're a wonderful parent. You're doing a great job. And if you need more help and feel that this is a topic that you want a little bit more information on, definitely check out my book, but also in the podcast, I have a million podcast episodes on these topics and my free resources at Dr. Yami. So that's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-M-I.com forward slash free is where I have lots of downloads that can help guide parents. That's perfect. And I think that's great that you said that because a lot of people will feel like, oh, I did that. I did the worst thing she said not to do, you know, like, yeah. and they'll beat themselves up that they did that particular thing. Yeah. And it's important for people to know that the only reason I learned any of these things is because I'm the same as you. <laughs> so, <laughs> believe me, the reason I know that everybody at the dinner table will end up in tears is because that happened to me multiple <laughs> times. I did all of those things because that's how I was raised. And yep. at some point I discovered that there's a different way. And now Food is just so fun at my house and there's no stress. And of course my kids are older, but I feel like we're at a point where it's just a really good balance between loving food and enjoying food, but also making choices to promote our own well-being for ourselves, you know? And so I'm really proud of my kids and I'm not worried at all about my son going off to college in the fall. Like I think he's going to do great and he's mm. going to learn his way. And I'm glad that he's had these years of practice where he knows I trust him and his choices. Absolutely. That's perfect. This is wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. This has been so much fun. I just enjoyed talking with you and learning from you. It's It's been a blast. You have an amazing array of things to offer people. It's just awesome. Oh, thank you, Julie. Well, yeah, I had so much fun too. I, I appreciate you asking me on and I hope that this was helpful to your audience. Absolutely. And everyone, I will put all the links down the podcast notes so that you can easily access her links and find all her books and her podcast and all that awesome stuff. So thank you. Thank you. You have an amazing day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.